There it is, the title, Computer Access for Children with Severe Dystonia. Um, I'm from Bruges. Actually, I'm connected with the KU Leuven, University of Leuven. Uh, and actually, I want to introduce you in severity or childhood uh, dystonia, but severe dystonia. I don't have to explain what dystonia is. You all know what dystonia is. Uh, but actually, I want to also overview, because dystonia is one of the movement disorders, and there are a lot of movement disorders specifically in childhood. You have dystonia, chorea, athetosis, myoclonus, traumatic stereotypes. And my topic is about dystonic, dyst or dystonic CP or dyskinetic CP. And you have to know, dyskinetic CP or dystonic CP is the largest cause of, this of dystonia in childhood disorders. This is an example of a boy who was born with dystonia. This is the way how, I will, I will repeat it, this is the way how he's rolling from his back to his belly. You can see the involuntary movements, a loss of control. And at the same time, you can see here, this is the way how he's reaching the handkerchief. Is it good? No. He cannot. He do not, he is not having the control about this. And this is often present in children with dyskinetic CP or dystonic CP. My question as a PT, because I'm a PT, is how to control involuntary movements in dystonia and coethetosis. And three keywords are important for me as a PT. That's one, that's evaluation of dystonia. That's two, that's the understanding of dystonia. And that's three, the management of dystonia. In the past, I did my research, and actually, I split this up in evaluation, in understanding, and the next step that we want to make is, of course, management. But first, things first. Let's start with the evaluation. Actually, we developed a new evaluation scale because the existing scales for measuring dystonia and childhood movement disorders were not uh, good enough for us to, to measure all the aspects of it. And that's the reason why we developed a new one, this Kinesia Impairment Scale. And it's a scale that overviews and dystonia and carithetosis in dyskinetic CP, or also called as dystonic CP. But of course, you can develop new things. The question is how reliable it is. It? And that's the thing that we have done in the past. We did the reliability study, test read test, inter-rate reliability, content validity, in experienced raters, but also in inexperienced raters. And actually, we found a good to excellent reliability. And that's the reason why we used the Dyskinesia Impairment Scale. And more specifically, the dis D, so the Dyskinesia Impairment Scale, Dystonia Subscale, and the Dyskinesia Impairment Scale, Corythetosis Subscale, to increase further understanding of dystonia and corythetosis in cerebral palsy. That's the second part, the understanding of the condition. In this paper, we overviewed the clinical patterns of these movement disorders in participants with dystonic CP. On the x-axis, you can see all the participants. And on the y-axis, you can see the percentage of presence of dystonia and corythetosis. And the dark blue, that's dystonia. The white, that is corythetosis. And what is obvious here? What is the most present here in color. I think it's a dark blue. It's quite obvious. And this was also one of the findings. It was a significant finding. We found that actually generalized, that dystonia and corythetosis are one, generalized present, but two, that they were also simultaneously present. A second important finding was that dystonia dominates also the other conditions, the other movement disorders. And three was actually that dystonia and corythetosis were increasing with increasing activity. So the moment that people with dystonic CP are coming active with voluntary asked activities, then you can see that dystonia is increasing. Functional classification scales. I don't know how many people are working with children with dystonic CP. Perhaps raise your hand or not if it's not the case. Just give me a picture of it. OK, one. Then I will give you a little bit more information about the functional classification scales are. Functional classification scales are important for prognostication, goal setting, and manageable planning, specifically in this population group. And the gross motor, most of that, gross motor functional classification, okay, that's here. 
that's the gross motor function classification. So that means the higher the level, the more inability or disability there is. So level one is people can walk independent. And level five, people are depending from somebody else from go to go from point A to go to, to, to point B. That's for gross motor function. We also have that for the manual ability classification skills, so for manual abilities, but also for the communication function classifications. And that means in what way is a child with dystonic CP able to communicate with parents or people he's, he, he's not knowing them. Uh, so this is a way how the interactivity, or the interaction is with people in communication. These are the three oldest classification skills, and the other two skills are the ETAX, that's the eating and drinking ability classification skills, and the Viking speech classification skills. Why am I giving this, you these slides? Because I want to give you a function profile. What is present in dystonic CP? Well, actually, and let's start with the GMFCs and the MAX. You can see again, the cursor is not, okay, use this. So here, you can see dark blue, level four, five, dark green, level four, five. So that means almost 60% of children with dystonic CP cannot walk, cannot sit, cannot eat, or, or cannot, cannot do things in an independent way. So they are depending from other people to do some things. So there is a high correlation between diagnosis of dystonic CP and inability, so not walking, not sitting independently. Let's move further. What about CFCS? Well, CFCS, or communication, that is giving a completely other story. Because here you can see a minority is classified as four and five. This is important to know because these are often children that are locked in with a good intellectual ability, okay? So they don't have the ability to go from point A to point B but they can communicate with AACs, with high-tech AACs, low-tech AACs, and that's what my talk is also going about. What about Viking speech skill? That's another skill, and again, you can see here, that's the dyspraxia, not able, or this, 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 not able to make the talking or to understand, uh, or, to give a, or to make an understandable speech. That's for the Viking speech skill, and this is very similar as the GMFCS and the MAX. So the function profile, this is a high disabled population. Of course, my question is, what about man management? I'm a PT, I'm a physical therapist, and I want to know what is possible. And if I would be a parent, I want to know what can we do? But actually, what would a parent do if he or she is hearing a diagnosis? It's a reflex. They do the Dr. Google. And if you do the Dr. Google, what can you find on the internet? You can find a lot. Botulinum toxin, oral medications, orthotics, ITB, Voita, constraint-induced modified therapy, massage, DBS, castings, osteopathy, and so on, and so on. You have it all. So the question is here, in this story, what is evidence-based? What is allowed to use and what is not allowed to use? And that's the reason why we have research, to look what is evidence, what is working and what is not working. Well, we did that. We did a systematic review. We did a systematic review, split it up in medical management, but also in non-medical management. Um, during the past two days, there was a lot of focus on medical management. I think so. It's correct? Okay. With, indeed, botulinum toxin, uh, deep brain stimulations, other path uh, um, uh, medical interventions possibly. And we also did a systematic review together with the AACPDN, so that's American Academy of Childhood Disability. And this is recently published with, with the title Pharmacological and Neurosurgical Interventions for Managing, Managing Dystonia in Cerebral Palsy. And actually here you can see the flow chart or the flow diagram, what is evidence-based, or what is good enough to use, and what is not. And I will highlight it, hi highlight it a little bit more because these are really small letters. In green, you can see it is effective. In yellow, okay, you can see it is probably or possibly effective. And in purple, you can see data and it are inadequate. 
So where is the green? Most of the things, or most of the studies are inadequate, or the data is inadequate to say this is working or this is not working. But this is for evidence-based. Clinical practice, or clinical evidence, is telling us some things completely different. Telling us that some things are working and some things are not working. So this is for the medical part. But also, this is a recent publication that we published in the Lancet Neurology, specified or specific towards dystonic CP. And it's entitled Clinical Presentation and Management of Dyskinetic CP. You can find it on the internet. Uh, and if you have some questions about it, you can also always send me an email. But important is we have some learning information there. Because also we have given there that the medical management options are not appropriate as stand-alone treatment. That's one. Two is combinations with rehabilitation approaches carried out by PTs, OTs, speech and language therapists are key components in the management of dystonia. And three, the current practice is mainly based on clinical experience. The expertise is usually offered by dedicated multidisciplinary rehabilitation teams designing individualized management programs that begins as early as possible in the life of the patients. And this is a link with the message. I think this was one of the take home message of JP Lin uh, last morning. They about start early enough, early in the life of the patients. But I'm talking about management, non-medical management, so PT, OT, speech language therapists, and others. And in our systematic review, these were the articles that we have found, that we have selected. NDT, so boba therapy, or neurodevelopmental therapy, speech language intervention, training with AAC, so assistive devices and new technologies, also one paper concerning transcranial direct current stimulation, and others. And the question is here then, what is evidence-based in DCP? Based on the criteria of evidence-based. This is your answer. No. No. Does it mean that nothing works? Not at all. This means that we have a lot of work to do to prove what is working and what is not. But we know, we know that some things are working and that we can help children with, this, with uh, DCP. And we know there is a lot. I want to focus on this topic, communication. We all know how important communication is to communicate, but also to make access, to have a window towards, towards what's happening around in the world. And you can use, of course, low-tech AACs, communication books, symbols, uh, body language, etc. But of course, you can also use other things. But what will you use if your arm, hand, leg function is very limited? For example, in these dystonic CPs with a GMFCS level of 60% of 4 and 5, GMFC or a max manual ability classification level with a 4 and 5, what will you do? How will you have access? Because if you want to steer your computer, or if you want to higher or lower the temperature in the room, you have to do it with something, isn't it? So actually, we are using the, for that eye tracking systems. Eye tracking systems because it works. Is there evidence for it? Not yet. But we all know, all the people who are working with dystonic CPs know that this is working. This is a good tool to, to have a window for these children to the world. So I will just give you some pictures, some videos of eye tracking, because we are using this at a very young age. We're using this for choice making in a young child. Sorry. OK, here it is. And I hear sound is not working. Okay. Oh, he's sure he's so this is the stonic CP child. He's not able to use his hands, but he is able to use his eyes to make connection. I will go back. What is making connection? This tool is making connection. Okay. This tool is grasping the eye movements. It's making the connection with the computer, and this is the way. This is the way how he can move his or her cursor. We use it, of course, for choice-making at 
at a young age, but also to explore. Another example. I can see your eyes, Mark. Again, the calibration, that's okay, that's but so then to clever. explore. To search things, to play games, some but also to use it in the classrooms. This is a training program that we started with DC, DCP children. Also in collaboration with the Sydney University and CP Alliance in Australia. Another example. It's important for home training programs because in rural companies or rural areas, it's not always able to, to have this. Or it's not available to have a PT coming at home. So for training programs, this is important. Home training programs. Targeting. He's, he, he's doing this with his eyes, but also for writing. This is an older child working with the eye tracking system. Using the system, select the words, select the letters, with word prediction also. And in that way he can communicate, he speaks with his computer. This is practical evidence. We know that this is working. But of course, insurances, policy, they want to have to know, is it working, yes or no? So that's the reason why we, did, we are doing uh, a study right now. The results of the data collection is finished. We started last week with the data analysis, and hopefully we can bring that the next time. Just to give or just to highlight what we are using, we are using gaze plots, we are using heat maps to see what is the success rate, what is the error rate, how long is the gaze focused on the object, how many trials are necessary to do it. This was an example of what eye tracking can do to communicate, but of course, how it is a window towards the road. Thank you for your attention.